So I think the headline at the, the, on, the, on the website was something about like an Uber case study. Uber's not a case study of failure. However, my previous 10 years before Uber are most definitely a case study of failure. So that's what I'm gonna talk about. I'm happy to talk about like how some karma came back and in the form of Uber, I'm, I'm down for that. But I'm gonna talk about failure here, guys, and just basically do it through a bunch of stories, through 10 years of entrepreneuring, essentially. All right, so the sort of, the thesis of this, this speech or presentation is basically, I am submitting my application for the non-luckiest entrepreneur of the year. Unlucky means you got unlucky, like you can't sell a company and say you're unlucky. But I'd like to say I sold a company and worked so hard and saw, excuse me, I, got diet, I drink a lot of Diet Coke. Um, so, worked so hard and saw so much failure in doing so that it makes me the non-luckiest entrepreneur. I will go up against any of you here and I guarantee you I am more non-lucky than any of you. So, it started a long time ago. I was actually, um, I was at UCLA, computer engineering, and me and a bunch of buddies started, started a company called Scour. And uh, it was basically the internet's first peer-to-peer -peer search engine, first peer-to-peer -peer app. Essentially, you could, the first place you could type something in, like Britney Spears, or Gladiator, or whatever, and get files that you probably weren't supposed to get which was definitely not fail for our customers. Um, and so it was rainbows and unicorns because, man, we were naive. A lot of failure starts with naivete, but so does a lot of success. That's not what I'm here to tell, talk about, though. All right. So we, the, the name of the company was called Scour, and uh, we sort of got going at UCLA, and we eventually, um, our senior year at UCLA, we, we got funded. We got funded. Um, by uh, two sort of big media moguls in Los Angeles who wanted to get on the dot-com bandwagon, a guy named, uh, a guy named Ron Burkle, uh, who is sort of a billionaire tycoon dude, and another really rich dude named Michael Ovitz, who was founder of CAA, president of Disney, and well known to be the shark of sharks. Um, and so he treated this funding situation with us um, like an entertainment deal. And so what he did, he saw a bunch of sort of talent come in, essentially kids out of UCLA, and he wanted to get a piece of it, and so he put down a term sheet. The term sheet, of course, the, the, the term sheet had a, a no-shot clause in it, meaning I can't talk to anybody else about getting funding from anybody else. We were running out of money uh, because server costs were going up and our, our site's traffic was going through the roof. So we signed this term sheet, um, and then he strung it out because he wanted us to run out of money and then get more of the company. And so I had to call him after it ran out. We had to extend the, the, the LOI, it was a letter of intent. And, um, and then it ran out again. And then I had to call Michael Ovitz up and say, look, we're running out of money. You're not funding this, it's clear, I get that, that's okay. We gotta go and find money. And three days later, we got sued. We got sued for, what was the reason? Oh yeah, shopping the deal, like going and trying to find funding while we were still under an LOI, which we didn't do until we were no longer under the LOI. But what, what investor sues, like in this situation? So we literally, went, the next day, so we got sued, the next day it showed up in the Wall Street Journal. I wonder how that happened. And now we've got this really litigious, hardcore dude out of LA suing us, it's in the Wall Street Journal, do you think anybody else is going to give us money? No. So we got sued by an investor to take his money. <laughs> so we got his money and you know, we made nicey nice with, with Ovitz and then um, we got sued the same way, this is another lawsuit, uh, we got sued the same way that Napster got sued, which was, um, the entertainment industry being really pissed off about, um, about their video and music getting distributed without them getting paid. Um, we like to say we were you know, just a search engine. Uh, we weren't actually distributing, excuse me. Um, but that didn't make them happy, any happier. 
So in August of 2000, we got sued for a quarter of a trillion dollars, which at the time was the GDP of Sweden. <laughs> um, by 33 of the largest media companies in the world. So let's see, what did we do with that? Well, we didn't have it in our back pocket, so what we did was we made a strategic move. Um, the strategic move was to declare Chapter 11 bankruptcy. And, and let's see, what did we do with that strategic? Oh yeah, so when you declare Chapter 11, a big lawsuit like that essentially goes away. It falls under the bankruptcy court. Um, the media companies were really, really scared about a bankruptcy court settling copyright law. The same way you see ultimately YouTube prevail, they were afraid we were gonna prevail, but it was gonna happen in two weeks instead of 10 years. And they were very worried about that. They prefer no, it not being settled at all, but just squish us and make us go away. So basically we, uh, we turned the technology off. Well, actually, I need to go then. Well, the strategic move. Hold on one sec. So the strategic move was chapter 11. We still were in business, and I was getting on the phone every day, still trying to make revenues, because we had millions of users going to our site, and telling our partners that it was a strategic move, when really what was happening is we were getting crushed, and our, our site, we were basically going to go out of business. And what I found is the longer, the more months, the more days that I had to make that strategic move pitch, um, the harder it was to get up in the morning. Um, basically, by the time we actually truly went out of business, um, I, I was probably sleeping 14 hours a night. Because what was happening was, is I was doing the game which I call fake it till you make it, or basically fighting reality. And when you do that too long, in, when you're in that failure state, um, it will eventually crush you. Um, so anyways, in, I'm saying it so lightly. Oh, it'll just crush you, no big deal. <laughs> Whatever, who cares? Maybe I should sit down. Maybe sitting down would be better, I don't know. Let's try that for a second. Um, all right, oh, that just happened. Um, <laughs> this is the one thing I love about the fail con, is like whatever I do up here, it's totally okay. <laughs> um, so, so let's see, so, so my company got acquired, it was actually pretty cool. Um, we had an auction for our company happening in a courtroom with a judge as the auctioneer and literally in a matter of 20 or 30 minutes, our company was sold. Okay, now anybody who's seen, who's actually gone through an acquisition knows that's crazy town because usually it takes six months and like all kinds of negotiations, all kinds of paperwork. Like I literally, I want to find a way to sell a company legitimately in a courtroom because it would just be so much easier. So basically a month later, I started what I call a revenge business. The, the name of the company is called Red Swoosh. The idea was the same peer-to-peer -peer technology but I take those 33 litigants that sued me and turn them into customers. So now those dudes who sued me are now paying me. <coughs> Sounded good. Um, <laughs> it took six months. These were my, what we ultimately did was we took the face off peer to peer. It was no longer an app that you interface with. It was now a network stack in the background. So you click on a YouTube video. Instead of pulling over YouTube servers over YouTube bandwidth, instead you pull from 30 peers close by and you get the same video streamed to you the same way, but now YouTube saves hundreds of millions of dollars in bandwidth and servers. That was the idea. And so companies like YouTube or really media companies would ultimately pay us for this thing. The problem was, the problem was is that we were about five years too early to market essentially. And it was January 01, and I was starting a networking software company. Are you freaking kidding me? So I, the company I was disrupting, disrupting was a company called Akamai, whose market cap had gone from like $50 billion to $160 million on the public market. So I was out there pitching, Red Swoosh was the name of the company, to VCs, and they're like, okay, what's the market? Like, how big is it? Like, what's the leader in the market? I'm like, the leader in the market's Akamai. They're like, Akamai's worth $160 million. Why am I gonna give you any money? Um, in August of that year, basically times were getting tough. We're starting to run out of money. Basically, we had some consulting gigs to pay the bills. I had a team of seven people. We were actually doing really great work and enjoying ourselves, and then uh, and I started doing VC meetings, and we were starting to get some kind of traction. My co-founder on Red Swoosh 
um, I found out, sent an email to um, a VC at Sony, Sony Ventures, um, basically saying, look, this, this wasn't, I wasn't CC'd on this email, saying, look, this isn't gonna work out. Um, why don't you just hire me, this is my co-founder, and the rest of the engineers? So that's what a tu brute means, okay. Uh, that hurt, I basically, when I, when I saw that, I had to go outside, I think the world was kind of spinning a little bit. Um, and on September 22nd, 2001, we actually ran out of money. And um, by that time, I kicked out my co-founder, and we, we essentially had run out of money, and I had to rally the troops, because I still believed in what it was we were doing. Um, and so we, we, let's see, I think we worked for three months straight with my team of seven people not making a single dime. There's one other thing I found out when I got rid of my co-founder. He was handling all the accounting and he was not withholding any money for the IRS. So we owed $110,000 to the IRS in unwithheld income taxes which is a white collar crime that pierces the corporate shell. And it doesn't matter whether you knew or not, if you're an officer at the company, you're going to jail. So I remember I was still having VC meetings because I needed to get money to pay off the IRS. And I also needed money, I, I also needed money to pay off uh, the engineers whose sort of accrued salaries were sort of, you know, slowly but surely building up. And, um, I remember having a meeting at a VC, and anybody who was here during the dot-com bust saw this. I had a meeting with the VC. It was at a, at a sort of restaurant and bar in Silicon Valley that before, like in 2000 or 99, you'd probably need to get a reservation at like three weeks in advance, and it was completely empty. It was like tumbleweeds blowing through. And I remember him telling me, like, look, man, this whole software thing, it's done. <laughs> I swear to God, a smart VC. Um, there's nothing left to innovate. Like all the innovation that matters, it's been done. Swear to God he told me this. So eventually, in December, after three months of no pay, I found a VC firm called Chaos Ventures. <laughs> and check this out, they were a Korean family whose last name was Chow, and they added an S because there were many Chows. <laughs> they gave me $300,000. Now $110,000 went to the IRS. $100,000 went, um, went to my engineers who weren't getting paid for three months, and I had $90,000 left. Now, one thing I like to tell a lot of entrepreneurs that I used to invest in when I, when I was seed investing is that I, during these years, I got really good at negotiating from a position of weakness. And I remember I was sort of breadcrumbing out these little factoids while trying to get them excited about what we were doing. And I remember the valuation went from like 300,000 at a $3 million valuation to 300,000. Like they basically said, look, we want to still put in the 300,000, but with all these facts and whatever, we want it to be, we want this note to be at a million dollar cap. And a lot of, a lot of entrepreneurs would just sort of fight it. And like this, I got really good at negotiating from a position of weakness, which means, sounds good, let's sign. <laughs> <laughs> so in 2000, so what happened was I got this money, I had $90,000 to keep my team up and running. My team basically decided that they were gonna unionize. And what that means is that they're no longer gonna go like any time without getting paid for the time that they were working. And basically they said, if you're gonna have us I'm like, guys, we gotta make this stretch, otherwise we're gonna be out of money in a month and a half. They're like, if you're gonna pay us part-time, we're working part-time. And so I stretched it out as long as I could, and um, I was talking to this big telecom company, uh, Cable and Wireless, and they, uh, they were, all their senior staff, their senior brass, was all really, really excited. They were a competitor of Akamai's, really excited about my technology. And we were getting sort of towards the end of my money. And I called a meeting, with the, uh, with the chief strategic officer of the company. And I basically said, you guys love us. I love you guys. You want to use this technology. I am going to go out of business in 15 days if you don't give me money. 
please be my customer. <laughs> he said, how much do you need? I said, 150 grand. And a week later, it was wired. So let's see, hold on a second. <laughs> All right, well, let's just do it. Here we go. So anyways, I used that cable and wireless deal to get, VC, to get a VC to actually put money in. He was like, wow, cable and wireless put money in. I'm like, yeah. They, they're a customer of ours because they love us. They couldn't, they couldn't wait to give me money. And, um, and I signed a $10 million term sheet with a VC, which probably should remain unnamed. But essentially, uh, they, they, I signed a $10 million term sheet. The only issue, of course, was that they wanted another VC to come in and put the other $5 million in. So I wasn't going to get any money until like, some other dude came in, which is basically a VC saying, eh, you know, I want an option on your company, essentially. And um, I said, well, that's nice, but you're going to put in 500 grand right now to show me that you're for real. You know, hey, look, I'm, I'm living hand to mouth. Basically, I was about to run out of money again, right? And so then I'm like, you know, so I get an extra half mil in the bank. That will keep me going for a few months. And so they did. We signed the term sheet. I found other VCs to come in, but the original VC said, no, nah, we don't really like them. In the meantime, I'd built a senior management team and I'd burned through all my 500K. So VCs ain't shit but hoes and tricks. That's just hilarious, I just wanted to say that. <laughs> this isn't worried. oh, here we go. This is a good one. All right, so basically, oh, all this time, by the way, I didn't pay myself a dime. I hadn't paid myself any money at all. Um, and uh, I, I like to call these years my blood, sweat, and ramen years. Um, and so uh, I was always very much believing in what we were doing, but it wasn't really clear that anything was going to happen. And so uh, in sort of mid-2003, Microsoft came to the table and we started talking about our technology and they wanted to put peer-to-peer -peer into the operating system itself. Imagine any time you log into the network on a Windows box. Remember, this is when Windows was, was big and awesome. Um, and any time you log into the network, um, you would basically get on the Windows grid and our technology would be powering that. It sounds freaking awesome. Um, we did all the diligence, the whole nine, uh, they are ready to do a deal, acquire us essentially. Call from Bill Gates' office, the whole nine, it was just amazing. Um, and then I'm talking to the corp dev guy who's responsible for the deal and he says, look, we're gonna give you a term sheet. I'm like, that sounds great. He's like, um, you know, we wanna, we wanna fly in tomorrow and present it to you. I said, that sounds really good. I said, but why don't you tell me the number now, like at least give me some guidance so that it's not a really short trip. And he said, he said, Travis, I'm really, I'm really confident you're gonna love what, we're, what we put together. We just wanna be there um, and do this in person. I said, all right, but it could be a short trip. And again, I'm in a very weak position, but sort of acting strong. Um, Anyways, a tip for any entrepreneur, if somebody tells you that, they're about to lowball you, okay? And I've seen it, I've now seen it enough times to know that that just is the case, okay? Um, so yeah, so they came by, they basically offered a $1.2 million acquisition of my assets, whereby $1.2 million that they're paying is going to pay off $900,000 in notes and liabilities. So basically it was a $300,000 acquisition. And they presented that at the beginning of the meeting, and I think the meeting lasted like 10 minutes. And the first minute was them telling me that, the other nine minutes was me yelling at them. <laughs> and it hurt, because I was, I was without pay, I was, I was done. I was living in mom and dad's. I was not getting ladies. <laughs> <laughs> it, it sucked, right? <laughs> And, but I believed, I believed, but like, and it got so close, but then they took it from me and it was really, it was hard. Um, and so I saw this for a couple of years, it's like people wanting to acquire our company, people who are interested, big companies wanting to get involved, and me getting really, really close, but it never actually happening. I saw this happen for basically a couple of years, Microsoft was sort of the start of that. Um, and it sort of, what in a weird way, kept me going because there was always this shiny ball that was just right there that I could almost taste that never ended up happening. So somehow I'd convinced the folks over at the World Economic Forum that I was a technology pioneer. <laughs> I was really a failure pioneer. <laughs> and, 
And I, went, I got to go to Davos, which is freaking amazing. Um, you know, I like to think of the technology pioneers, they invite like 15 every year. This is like you get to hang out with heads of state and like Fortune 500 companies. I like to think of the tech pioneers as um, entertainment for the old guys. <laughs> but what happened was the first tweet that I ever saw was, was actually sent to me while I was in Davos. And it was my only engineer, I forgot to tell you, like all my engineers left except for one. Right? And we were just scrapping by, getting revenues, just trying to make ends meet. My only engineer sent me a 140 character resignation letter. <laughs> um, basically saying, it's been a great four years, I'm going over to Google. Now, that's interesting. Um, the person who recruited him at Google was my former co-founder. Now, while this all happened, somehow or another it leaked that I was about to lose my last engineer. And uh, what happened? Oh yeah, it hit fucked company. At the same time while I was in Davos, I was negotiating a million dollar a year revenue deal with AOL. They saw the fuck, I was literally redlining a long form agreement. They saw the, the fuck company post and they backed out of the deal. So in March 05, I, there was a true angel that came to the table. Uh, actually, somebody who was in, interested much earlier, a guy by the name of Mark Cuban, um, who was really interested in my business, um, and I just kept telling him, no, no, I'm not taking investment. Basically, I had nothing for him to invest in. Um, and, uh, but then, you know, when that AOL thing was happening, we were trying to get it done, I tried to pull him into it, et cetera. He put in about a million bucks. 300,000 of which paid off those chaos dudes. <laughs> but basically, remember, so I, my customers were like News Corp, Viacom, like big telecom companies. And, oh, there we go. Um, and I had no engineers. Now I'm an engineer by training, but Jesus. Like it's been a long time since I like, coded and it was meaningful. And, um, I call. I basically had this deal with the engineer. He was a quirky guy. I could only get his his help after 10 p.m. on Tuesdays and Thursdays. <laughs> so I call him and basically be like, hands and knees, like, so do you think you can? And it was really painful. So now we're already to 2006, um, and. Uh, Basically, I'm really starting to get what I call swoosh hairs. This is like the white hairs you see right here. Um, and uh, I just had to do something fun. And so I did something which we called offshoring ourselves, which is um, we would always talk about, hey, we're just coders. Why don't we go to some exotic island and code from there? You know, why not, right? And jet skis and like girls in bikinis, it'll be amazing. Um, and then our lease ran out on our office space and we said, shit, let's just do it. And so we, three days, you know, we, that night we went to Mel's Diner in San Francisco. Everybody threw a location in the hat and we ended up like three days later, we were on a flight to Thailand. <laughs> and we ultimately worked there for two months um, from the beach, one of the most beautiful beaches in the world. Um, it was great. <laughs> great way to have fun while you're failing. <laughs> so by, November of 06, basically I was running out of money again. And uh, we were in discussions with EchoStar, which is Dish TV, for another million dollar a year type revenue deal. Deal was ready to go, they were ready to sign, the whole nine, and uh, Mark, it was, our, the board was me and Mark Cuban. He, he was kind of done with the business. He was just not interested anymore. And maybe it was my offshoring extravaganza that sort of upset him a little bit. I still don't totally know. Um, but uh, we got to an impasse. Now, good by him, he basically said, look, I'm out. You can go have, you can go figure out a way to get money or get me bought out, like at cost. Um, so basically, I called all the VCs that had ever tried to hit me up, who I said, oh, we're not taking investment. I said, look, I need to do a partner meeting next Monday. Let's go. And pitched them all basically on the vision and said, look, here, here's, here's the catch. My largest investor uh, wants out. <laughs> this always works at VC meetings. <laughs> I said, 
I have an option to buy his stock at cost. Um, simultaneous with you buying that option, I am going to sign a deal with EchoStar for a million dollars a year in revenue. And our valuation will then multiply instantaneously like 5x or 10x or something like this. And that night, a uh, VC at Crosslink, a guy named Jim Foy, said, let's do it. And so it was the craziest deal I've ever seen because it was a four-way deal. It was me, it was Mark Cuban, it was New VC, and it was Echo Star, and all those deals had to be done at the same time. I almost lost my mind. <laughs> oh, and I told Mark, I said, look, Akamai is liking our stuff. I was having discussions with him. I think they're gonna acquire us. I think they're gonna freaking acquire us. Just hang in there, man. And it, it, it was just, you know, it was just done. Um, but in April of 07, Akamai acquired us. And uh, the deal was, so at that point, I think I had like, we were built our team back up. We were like six or seven people at that point. Um, maybe 10, something like that. And uh, they bought us all in for about 23 million bucks. So that's my application for non-luckiest entrepreneur of the year. And that's it, thank you.